minutes after, so uh, <clears throat> why don't we uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, Concrete Sustainability Hub webinar series, and uh, we've been doing webinars about uh, every month and uh, or so, and this is our third one. And um, uh, the past few were kind of high-level overviews of our research on both pavements and buildings. And what we're going to start doing now is getting uh, a bit more into some of the details of some of the topics related to our research. And um, the one that I'm going to be talking about today is our work on uh, price projection modeling for pavement life cycle cost analysis. Uh, my name is uh, Jeremy Gregory, and I'm the executive director of the Concrete Sustainability Hub. And uh, this is some work that I've done with uh, Omar Sway, who was a, a PhD student who recently graduated, is now on a Fulbright Scholar, and also uh, my colleague uh, Randy Krishain, uh who's also the co-director of the Concrete Sustainability Hub. So um, when it comes to uh, life cycle cost analysis, uh, probably uh, some of you are familiar with this, but it's a, a concept basically to evaluate the total uh, cost of uh, ownership. And um, what we want to do is basically transform individual pavement expenditures over time um, into a total life cycle cost. And so what we do is we start with uh, initial construction costs and then look at rehabilitation costs in the future. And um, when we're usually going to do it to compare different alternatives. And uh, the key point about this is just because something has a higher initial cost, like alternative A, uh, does not necessarily mean it's going to have higher life cycle costs, right? It could have lower ones. And so um, this is particularly relevant, as you might imagine, for uh, pavements which have a very long lifetime and uh, have both initial construction and then rehabilitation costs throughout their uh, future. <clears throat> Um, part of the motivation for our research is trying to improve the type of uh, decisions that are used, uh, the, 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 the cost estimates that are done in these decisions. And there was some interesting research that was done several years ago uh, quantifying cost overruns and in infrastructure projects. And what they found is that, um, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, inaccuracy in the uh, uh, estimates of cost for projects. In fact, they found that, you know, 90% of the uh, projects were estimated to be uh, over costs and, you know, quite a bit uh, under costs as well. So, so uh, part of the ways that we can do that is by uh, improving the data that's used. Um, when it comes to life cycle cost analysis, there are many sources of uh, uncertainty. Uh, for example, when it comes to the agency cost that we are considering, there's uncertainty in the unit price of inputs, like the, the initial cost of, say, the paving materials and the construction, also the quantity of inputs that are used. And then in those costs uh, over time, there's um, uncertainty in the input, the amount of inputs that are used in the future, the prices of uh, uh, construction in the future, timing of maintenance. There's also uh, costs associated with the uh, users due to traffic delays and fuel loss. Um, so at, uh, it, We'll be talking about uh, some of the work that we've done creating uh, probabilistic life cycle cost analyses or uh, cost analyses that include uncertainty. We'll be talking about that at a future webinar. But today, um, what I'm going to be focusing on is focusing on is some of the work that we've done in uh, quantifying uncertainty in future uh, construction prices that are used in uh, life cycle cost analyses. Now, the, the, uh, the standard practice for life cycle cost analyses is to use uh, real prices. Um, so one of the first things I want to do is differentiate real prices um, from uh, nominal prices. Uh, and so nominal um, uh, prices are basically the value of uh, something uh, in, in the money value for that particular year. So this, for example, is showing data from uh, the U.S. Energy Information Administration for gas prices over the past, you know, approximately 90 years or so. And um, what it's showing in this blue line, the nominal prices of gas have uh, increased uh, quite a bit, right, going from, what, like a quarter a gallon up to about 350 in, uh, in 2011. But um, what we're actually going to be uh, using are what we call um, real prices. Uh, and these basically adjust for the differences in the price level 
in these different years. So basically, a dollar in 1919 meant something different than a dollar in 2011. So real prices account for uh, that uh, inflation. So what you can see is that actually, when you put all of the dollars uh, over this past 90 years uh, in the in the same um, kind of uh, same uh, meaning in terms of uh, inflation. So this is February 2012 dollars. Uh, gas prices actually have gone down quite a bit until they uh, jumped up, and as we know, they've, they've gone back down. But um, so, so when it comes to doing these long-term prices, the way that we take out the uh, effects of inflation is to do analyses in um, real prices. Now, um, most, uh, it, you know, one of the things that's interesting is that, you know, prices change differently for uh, different materials. Uh, this is showing uh, normalized real prices for three different uh, construction materials, asphalt, uh, concrete, and lumber. And what you can see is this is uh, over a period <clears throat> about 40 years, um, and they're all normalized to um, 100 in uh, the year 1976. And so, um, uh, it basically, if we assume there's no change in real prices, that is, uh, basically all of these um, tracked the same level of inflation as other uh, uh, materials in the uh, the whole uh, economy, then um, then these would just be flat lines. That would mean they're following the same rate of an inflation. What you can see is that they uh, they actually follow uh, a quite uh, uh, different paths, particularly in the past uh, 10 years. There's some similarities uh, early on, and then they diverge uh, pretty bit, uh, pretty quite quite a bit. Um, and you can see the average annual price changes um, are are pretty diverse. And so most LCCAs assume constant uh, real prices, but we can see that uh, that's not the case. Um, and in particular, when we look at um, uh, the past, uh, you know, uh, 10 or 15 years, what we can see is that um, the growth rate, particularly when it comes to paving materials, asphalt and concrete, have been quite different and have been uh, different than the consumer price index, which is basically a uh, metric that's used by the government to track what uh, inflation is. So. Um, so this leads to a question, you know, why should we assume that future prices grow with inflation? And if not, then can we account for this uh, credibly? And that's, that's basically trying to answer those questions is a big component of our research. So when it comes to uh, price projections, uh, you know, this is something that's used by quite a few uh, government agencies. This is shown a chart that's in the U.S. Energy Administration's uh, annual energy outlook, and they're doing all kinds of uh, projections for prices over many decades, right? And they uh, will often, you know, for either oil or natural gas, and they have uh, some different assumptions, but you can see there's you know, quite a bit of volatility in these. Um, and then basically looking at this range right here is kind of how they account for some, some what ifs. Um, but note that although they look at different scenarios, they're not like inherently probabilistic, meaning account for uncertainty within each one. There's no error bands on those. Um, but you probably have seen some probabilistic projections without maybe even realizing that's what they were. We see this a lot in uh, in, in hurricane uh, projection paths. <clears throat> so um, an example here is basically this is showing Hurricane Isaac in uh, 2012. This is where the hurricane was um, on August 23rd, 2012, and they were basically projecting this is its path right here, and this is a, a median path. But you can see there is quite a range of uncertainty, and what you notice is that basically the range of uncertainty widens um, the further away you get from uh, that date, right? So <clears throat> at this point in time when they're doing this projection, they were saying, you know, all of Florida really is um, at risk and, and people need to take precautions. Um, but we should also note that there's quite a bit here that shows that Florida might not be at risk. Um, and when we look at, at the projection three days later, it was quite different. Um, you know, the hurricane actually just, you know, it, it hit the uh, Keys, but it didn't really get much of the mainland. 
So, um, you know, oops, going back to uh, what it was before, that path was certainly within that, that band of uncertainty, but it ended up being quite a bit different. Uh, so anyways, you know, so this is a good example of some of these probabilistic projections that basically say, here's how things could happen in the future, but the uncertainty gets them uh, wider as you go uh, more into the future. So. Um, now, when it comes to uh, the use of real prices and changes in real prices uh, in analyses, there's actually there's several federal agencies and organizations that support the use of real prices, uh, and include the Office of Management and Budget, the GAO, FHWA, ASTM, uh, Department of Commerce, and Department of the Army. Um, and the way in which they, they support those, they, you know, kind of depends on some of the uh, specific uh, uh, protocols they're talking about. Um, <clears throat> but basically, this is not like a, a new concept is, is, is what I'm getting at. Now, our objective in our work is, you know, getting back to can we account for the fluctuation in these real prices uh, in an effective way? And so what we're trying to do is to create effective long-term uh, probabilistic uh, price projections. Uh, you know, this is showing the real price of cement uh, over, you know, gosh, over 100 years, and you can see there's uh, quite a bit of uh, different fluctuations, but the key point here is we're not trying to say exactly what the price is going to be in the future, but rather say it's going to be within this range uh, based on uh, historic, the historical data. So um, what we've learned and what I'll talk about is that to make effective uh, price projections, you have to use uh, quite a bit of uh, significant historical data, and you have to view these as uh, probabilistic. So. One thing that we always try to have is, you know, all forecasts, remember, is that uh, there's a famous saying that all forecasts are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, and that's clearly the case here. Once again, we're not trying to make predictions about specific prices in the future, but rather to try to capture what are trends and what's the uncertainty in around the, those trends. So. Um, one of the interesting things when it comes to uh, paving materials is that we can look at data that's available for the paving materials themselves, like concrete and asphalt, but also for their uh, constituents, like crushed stone, cement, and sand and gravel, and, uh, and, and, and oil. Um, and actually, it turns out that there's quite a bit more historical data available for paving material uh, constituents. So the Bureau of uh, Labor and Statistics, uh, a government agency, um, you know, started collecting data on, on asphalt in 1985, which which sounds like um, quite a bit 30 years ago. But when it, what we've learned when it comes to these price projections, you're going to do a better job when you have even more historical data than that, so you can capture longer trends. Uh, and so what you can see here is that we have quite a bit more data when it comes to oil. Actually, uh, British Petroleum has been has some a, an amazing data set going back to the 1800s on on oil. Um, and it's also pretty amazing how the the real price of oil um, uh, was was pretty stable, obviously, until the crisis in the the 70s. Um, but there's also quite a bit of historical data on crushed stone and uh, cement as well. So the approach that um, we use to develop these price projections are one, to try to understand um, long-term price trends between the paving materials themselves and their constituents um, uh, in order to make sure that we do have a tight statistical connection between the, uh, the materials and their constituents. Then um, we use models to project the future price of those relevant constituents. Um, and then take those and then project the future price of uh, the paving materials. Uh, lastly, what we want to do is see, you know, how well do these projections do relative to um, the current practice of no change in real prices. So what I'm going to do is, is walk through these four steps to give you an idea of how they, they work and how we've used them. So the first one we do is uh, basically establish a long-run price trend between paving materials and their uh, constituents. And so we use this uh, uh, 
we, we do this based on what we call uh, statistically testing for co-integration. And what you do is basically look um, for trends in uh, material prices over time between uh, the paving materials and their constituents and uh, try and see what are the statistical models that we can use in order to correlate how those trends match with uh, each other. So there's kind of quite a bit of math that goes uh, into that. Um, then once we do that, then um, it helps us establish what kind of models can we use to project uh, the future prices of uh, the relevant constituents. So um, uh, what we do for the cement, crushed stone, and, and sand and gravel is we use uh, time series models. Um, which basically rely on historical data to uh, predict uh, future trends. And once again, this is a pretty uh, standard thing <clears throat> that's used in this space. It turns out oil is a bit more uh, tricky. Uh, it has um, what's called this mean reversion trend, where basically over long periods of time, um, it, it, even though uh, at the short term it, seem, it can seem highly volatile, over longer periods it has a, a trend that is following, and there's a model created by this guy, uh, Pindyke, um, who's actually here at, at MIT, um, that helps explain that. And so we use a specific model um, for oil. Um, the next step we do is we can then um, integrate those constituent models uh, using some particular uh, mathematical relationships to uh, create uh, models of, uh, for the paving materials um, themselves. Uh, and what I'm showing here on this chart are basically the paving models that we've used created based on the national data for the constituents um, and the paving materials. And we can see here that the, the solid lines in the middle are the means of the trends and then the dashed lines are the, um, the uncertainty bands. And so uh, concrete here is in gray and asphalt in black. And what's interesting is that, you know, it shows that the, the, the mean trends are saying that, um, you know, that there's predicted to be some slight uh, increases in, in real prices over time, um, but not too much, and it's not too different among the two. But what's different is basically the, the relative volatility among uh, both of these. Um, and, and so, and I think that's borne out in the data that we, we see in the paving material. Usually there is a bit more volatility in the asphalt materials, although we certainly see some of that in, in concrete as well. And lastly, what we do um, is we use an approach called backcasting to validate uh, the performance of the model compared to current practice. Um, and the way that we do this is basically we ask this question, you know, how well does our model project uh, what this commodity is going, the price is going to be 10 years into the future. And so we take a bunch of uh, historical data and then we go to some point um, in the past and we say, let's pretend we were in this particular year and we were making a projection into the future. Uh, we know what actually happened because we have that historical data and we can quantify what the error is uh, doing this <clears throat> for a whole bunch of different years. So let's say we're always doing either 10 years in the future or 20 years in the future. We can sum up all of that um, uh, uh, error and we call that the mean absolute percent error. It's a combination of all those and that's how we get that uh, average error. So, for example, this is showing the mean absolute percent error of the uh, projections, and um, the benchmark is basically that no change in uh, real prices. So, first of all, what you notice about all of them, whether it be the asphalt benchmark or the asphalt model, um, there is quite a bit of uh, fluctuations <clears throat> over time, and as you would expect, the, uh, the more you get out in the future, the more uncertainty there is, and including, you know, some, some higher uncertainty much further into the future. You, you have these, um, just some of these, these higher trends in asphalt just because of that um, higher volatility that uh, you see. Um, but what you also notice is that it can, uh, it, it, it actually uh, takes some time for the concrete model to have a, a lower uncertainty than the benchmark, and even <clears throat> the asphalt one uh, fluctuates until you get further into the future. But um, kind of going along our theme of, you know, all models are wrong and some, but some are useful, what we're really trying to capture is the uncertainty. And we use a little bit different metric to be able to do that. Uh, and, and that's shown um, on this chart right here, which shows the frequency that future prices uh, fell within 
a, a projected 75% uh, confidence interval. <clears throat> And these dashed lines right here are basically showing, when we look at the actual data, this is the bounds um, on the uncertainty prices. And what you can see is that uh, the, the, the model is capturing that uncertainty, you know, almost entirely, except for maybe very at the end for asphalt. So, so that's particularly um, what we're interested in. So let's say the fact that we can uh, capture these uh, these trends and, and use these models, how, how are we going to apply them? So one thing you can do is apply these price projections in pavement to life cycle cost analyses, as I mentioned. Um, here's an example that's showing a study on uh, comparing some a an asphalt and a, a concrete alternative on an urban interstate in uh, Joplin with a 50-year uh, analysis period. And um, what's interesting, when you, when you use this probabilistic approach, and this, by, by the way, we capture uncertainty not just in price projections, but also in initial costs and things like that. So, so the price projections are just one of uh, many things that are in here. But what we're showing here is the cumulative probability of the life cycle cost. Um, and um, what we're trying to basically say is, you know, what's the, the difference between these alternatives, the different risk profiles? And also, what's the risk of exceeding a specific uh, life cycle cost? So the way that you read this is basically you can say at a 50% confidence interval, you know, the 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 uh, concrete alternative would be a, the life cycle cost would be about 2.4 million, and the asphalt one would be about you know 2.7. So so about a 10% difference. We can also calculate a 90% uh, confidence interval, and so the confidence interval varies depending on where um, your uh, what it, it, the results depend on your confidence interval. Sorry, is what I meant to say. Um, and uh, so the, the price projections play into what the relative uncertainty of the alternatives is. You, you can also basically say what's the alternative that uh, a particular alternative, what, what, sorry, what's the uh, probability that a particular alternative will exceed a fixed level, like say $3 million. So for this, uh, the concrete one is 1%, the asphalt one is 23%. But um, those price projections uh, play into that. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that when we do a probabilistic analysis, we can see what are the factors that are contributing most to the uncertainty. And we use that using a metric called the contribution to variance. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we're accounting for uncertainty in several factors, including initial costs uh, and the price projections. When it, it comes to um, uh, concrete, which generally will have uh, higher upfront initial costs and then minimal maintenance, that the initial cost of the concrete layers plays a big role and the price projection plays less. Uh, asphalt, which will often have lower initial costs and then uh, more maintenance in the future, you see a bit more uh, balance between the initial costs um, and then the uh, price projection as well. So obviously the, the extent to which the price projections matter for an LCCA uh, will depend on the extent to which there's future, future maintenance activities that include the uh, materials. Um, the other uh, example of where these can be applied, though, is actually in uh, network allocation models. Uh, and we have some research we've been doing on this network allocation where basically what we're doing is, is uh, trying to support pavement management uh, system decisions where you take in data about the current condition of a system um, and then include projection of uh, prices and also pavement deterioration um, and then use an uh, optimization algorithm for a given set of objectives or goals to determine, you know, what's the best uh, what are the best pavement segments on which to do maintenance, um, and then uh, 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 how do you allocate your costs uh, across all of those? Um, so here's an example that we did uh, within uh, uh, the Virginia interstate network, and we looked at basically the whole network expenditures over a 50-year analysis period and basically saying that you have this constra budget constraint of $67 million in a single each year, um, and our objective is to minimize uh, traffic-weighted uh, roughness. So we're basically trying to improve the performance of the system, and our metric for performance here is the traffic-weighted roughness. Um, and what you can see is that basically this identifies where you have uh, low expenditures per area, medium, and high. And obviously in the urban areas where you get a lot more uh, traffic is where you see the higher um, uh, uh, amounts of uh, investment. 
Um, but what's also interesting, and particularly how the, the price projections uh, come into play, is that you can look at what the current composition of the system is, um, and it's, it's, it's mostly asphalt uh, uh, with, with some uh, concrete segments, particularly in the urban areas here. Um, but basically what the model predicts is that um, you have a, a more diverse set of uh, uh, pavement technologies in year 50, um, and a big part of that is related to the price projections. Uh, because basically, just like you want uh, diversification in your stock portfolio, you find uh, a similar uh, benefit here from having a diverse set of pavement uh, maintenance, uh, rehabilitation, and reconstruction alternatives, because there'll be times throughout those, those 50 years when uh, prices for one will be higher and prices for one will be the lower. Um, and so uh, uh, you, you basically, you wanna be able to leverage that and benefit from it um, throughout this whole uh, analysis period. And the way that this really manifests itself um, is when you look at the uh, uh, cumulative um, uh, density function results uh, for this. And so on this uh, uh, X axis here is showing the average traffic weighted IRI uh, over the, 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 the 50 year period. So we wanna be as much to the left as possible to get the maximum benefit from our uh, system. Um, and so once again, the way you read this, you know, like a 50% probability that you would have 82 inches per mile and 90% that you'd be at about uh, 70 or so. So this is within that uh, $67 million budget scenarios. If you have a diversified portfolio of being able to choose from either asphalt or concrete, depending on what are the benefits that you get and the prices in any given year, uh, if instead you looked at a concrete-only system or an asphalt-only system, you get uh, worse performance if you're only able to choose uh, one. Um, and uh, you get a, a bit wider range in uncertainty in the asphalt because of the higher volatility. But the bottom line here is having that, being able to use that uh, more diversified performance is really a, a benefit. And being able to capture that uncertainty in prices and their volatility uh, comes out of using those price projection models in this. So the price projection models actually probably mean a bit more in doing the network analyses because um, you, you, every year you're going to do some type of maintenance, rehabilitation, or reconstruction activity, whereas in an LCCA, you may or may not be doing that much uh, in the future. So, so it's particularly important here, and it's interesting that this uh, uh, diversification uh, result that, that we found. So. Um, the other thing that we've done with this is done some state-specific uh, price projection models. Uh, this is showing, um, uh, uh, and we, we started actually doing this with the uh, state of Colorado. And what we first did is we looked at um, uh, paving uh, prices in Colorado compared to the national average. Because as I mentioned, we did um, uh, some, uh, uh, we had already done, uh, created the price projections uh, using national level data. And what's interesting here, this is showing uh, asphalt prices and Colorado's are right here in red and the national average there in black. Um, and what you can see is that the Colorado prices, they, they, they you know, mimic the national ones, they're a little bit higher. When we look at uh, the concrete prices, the interesting thing is they're quite a bit more uh, volatile. And once again, this is uh, real prices for both of them. So when it came to developing price projections for Colorado, we had a couple different options. One was to use uh, basically state level data on paving prices um, and use that to basically uh, create a price projection model um, for uh, uh, Colorado. Um, the other one was basically to take the national level forecast and uh, scale them to the state level. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. But basically, in step one, it would mostly be using just the data that's available in the state to create the models, whereas in step two, it would mostly still be relying on those national level uh, forecasts. Um, so let's go to uh, step one. Um, what was interesting, and particularly in using the local data for um, concrete, it turned out to be um, pretty difficult. Uh, and, and that was primarily because the quarterly data was, was really volatile. We wanted to look at quarterly data because it gave us more data points, and in developing the price projections, we wanted as much data as possible. 
Um, but what, you know, as we note right here that, you know, the, the number of concrete pavement items per quarter in 2010 to 2011 is 13, but in some quarters it was just one data point. Um, whereas we compare that with like 104 for asphalt. And so you get really high volatility and it's, it's difficult to be, to be able to make uh, uh, an effective uh, price projection just based on the data that, that's in the state. At least in this state, uh, there just wasn't really enough for us to do that with concrete. So instead what we did is we took those national level um, forecasts and then um, because th there was some offset, you know, as we mentioned, the asphalt prices were a little bit higher, we could just scale those national level forecasts to uh, state level data. Um, and then we did the uh, back casting effort in order to see how well the model does uh, and in this case, it, it did even better than we saw with the national level one. This is showing the mean average percent error of those pr uh, uh, predictions into the future. Um, and what you can see here in red, you know, this is the, kind of that default assumption of no change in real prices, whereas here's the price projection model that we're using. So quite a bit of different there with asphalt. And concrete is a little bit tighter, but still no change in real prices. Um, uh, uh, was definitely higher, and you know we did we did better with the Colorado price projection model. So, so the recommendations we made was that uh, for Colorado that app applying those national level forecasts um, are promising when you can scale them to Colorado. Um, doing local forecasts might be difficult if you have a small data set um, and uh, high volatility. So. Um, we also went through a similar exercise with Minnesota where we ended up scaling these, and this is showing the backcasting results. Um, this is showing uh, if you had that assumption of no change in real prices uh, compared to the uh, price projection model uh, that we made for Minnesota, and then uh, here's concrete, no change in real prices, and then the dash line is the price projection model. So um, once again, you can see you're definitely better off using that uh, uh, price uh, projection model in this case. So, so just to uh, uh, wrap up, you know, probabilistic price projections, uh, they can be uh, created uh, from historical data and preferably as much historical data as possible, you know, usually on the order of, of decades. Um, <clears throat> uh, when you go through uh, backcasting efforts, you can demonstrate that they outperform some of those existing assumptions of no change in, in real prices. You can then apply them to either project or uh, network level analyses, um, and they can also be created for uh, state specific analyses uh, uh, using the particular uh, state level data. So, um, we have uh, a bunch of uh, supporting publications that get into a lot more details on this, and this are, these days are uh, listed on our website. Um, we have a, there's, there's a, a paper that uh, was just recently published that talks about uh, the approach for creating those long-run price projections. And if you're interested more in the math behind how all that works, uh, that's included in this publication. Um, and then there are some, uh, a couple other ones that get into a bit of, about how you then apply them in uh, life cycle cost analyses. Um, the last one here is basically just a, a document that's meant to be uh, geared toward a, a broader audience that's a, a report that basically uh, summarizes this in about uh, uh, 10 uh, pages or so. So that might be more interesting if you're not, not interested in the math, but still want to be a bit more uh, detailed on this. Um, and you can find uh, quite a bit more information uh, at our website and, uh, and also uh, send us a message if, uh, if you want to follow up. But um, right now we have uh, uh, some time for uh, questions. And uh, the best way to do that is to be able to is to type it in the uh, chat window, and then uh, Anne will let me know what the questions are, and I'll be glad to answer them. Do we have any you, questions? Yes, yeah, yeah. we have a couple that have come in. So the first question okay. is: Many slides have data through 2012. Can we expect similar presentations with updated data, or is five-year-old data the norm? Um, it, it, it's, it's a really good point. We uh, happened to be doing this several years ago, um, but we are in the process of updating some of those, uh, particularly as we do more network level analyses. So yeah, we'll, we'll, the short answer is yes, we're going to uh, be updating that data for including more uh, recent uh, price data that we have. Great. 
The next question I can actually answer. So the question is whether we can make this presentation available to attendees. Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, we'll have a video of this presentation available um, via our YouTube channel, uh, usually about 24 hours um, after we finish up here. Um, we can also provide the slides as well. You can email me or email cshub at mit.edu or my email address is Ann, Ann and E at mit.edu. We can get that out to you. Uh, next question is, in a state as large as California, would you recommend a statewide model or a district-specific model? Um, <clears throat> that's a uh, really interesting question. I, you know, I mentioned uh, when it comes to doing LCCAs that um, uh, another thing that we do, and we'll probably be talking about in another uh, uh, webinar, is uh, how to characterize uncertainty in initial prices. Um, and for initial prices, I think that for a state like California, um, <clears throat> it would definitely be good to do uh, uh, a, um, different district level models for initial prices. Um, but it would depend on the amount of data that's available uh, for each district. Like, uh, it could be that for some in the north where there's less projects, that could be more challenging. When it comes to um, state-level data, I'd have to um, run the numbers and be able to see. And it, it, we'd probably end up doing something like what we did in Minnesota, <clears throat> where we see how much data is available um, and then uh, give us you know, you know, allow us to do uh, an analysis of how good the projections are. For us, it's always going to come down to that backcasting exercise. You know, if we do that exercise and it shows that the projections are worse than um, using no real change, then we'll we'll go back to no real change. So, so we have to kind of run the numbers to see. Uh, California is big enough. I think you you could probably uh, do price projections using the existing data without scaling it based on the national level forecast, but you'd have to kind of dive into the numbers to see. Okay, another state question. Uh, is the price volatility in Colorado perhaps caused by variations of concrete quantities from year to year? Um, <clears throat> There's, um, it, it could be due to concrete quantities. It could just be due to just the number of jobs that there are as well. We have some other um, research that shows that, uh, you know, basically the more activity that you are, that can, the more activity that you have uh, in a state, that can affect prices. And so, um, I, I, you know, just like any paving jobs, there is going to be a seasonality to it, uh, and there are fluctuations in that, and that's what kind of interesting about the um, the uh, Colorado data, data. Excuse me, um, I was going to try and go back to it so we can look at it again, um, <clears throat> because you do see um, here it is quite a bit in that, right? This is, uh, it's quarterly, I mean, this is like a gap of three years, but there's still a lot of data here that's in um, quarterly. So I think a lot of it is due to, you see fluctuations even in the asphalt data uh, as well. It's just not nearly as uh, extreme. So I think it's due to a combination of factors of the volume, the seasonality, and then um, also the, the, I mean, because what, what we, the, sorry, the volume, the uh, seasonality, and then just the number of jobs there are as well. But um, ideally what we would do is we would take annual data that would help smooth that out, but then the challenge is that you just don't have as many data points that allow you to make the uh, uh, projection. So that's kind of the, the balance that we're trying to make here. Great. Uh, this is a question about tools available. For a project level pavement LCCA, are there tools other than real cost? Um, what happens is that, um, so, so real cost is, is, for those who don't know, is an FHWA created uh, LCCA tool. Um, and um, re real cost uh, does uh, probabilistic LCCAs, which is great, but it, it doesn't um, generate the inputs for an LCCA. That is, you know, you have to come up with your own unit prices and paving quantities and things like that. Um, and if you were, it also by default kind of assumes uh, the no change in real prices. So what a lot of states have done is they usually will start with real cost, and if they're doing their own LCCAs, then they will probably modify it to create their own. So a lot of states <clears throat> that are doing LCCA will actually provide some of their spreadsheet tools um, online that they're using. I, th I think at least Minnesota is one that I um, 
that, that comes to mind that, that follows that practice. Um, but th the short answer in terms of publicly available ones is, is no, there isn't really um, a, a, another one I can think of that's available for um, doing pavement LCCAs. Uh, but, but I would recommend uh, poking around on some of the uh, state DOT websites, uh, particularly for the ones that do LCCA, because I think a lot of times they have their tools available. California um, has a, a really good uh, manual available on how they do it. I can't remember if they have their spreadsheet tool also available, um, but th that could be another one to look at. All right, I have two that are similar, so I'm going to read them together. Uh, the first is, is this approach used in tandem with or in place of material-specific inflation rate? And the second question is, in an LCCA, do you suggest inflating materials at different rates when determining present value and hold rate of return the same for different materials? Yeah, this is kind of a um, complicated uh, uh, question about terminology. Um, and basically, because there's um, there are price projections that we're using here, but then there's a separate discount rate <clears throat> that's used across um, the whole LCCA. So we're not recommending here that we use different discount rates um, for the materials. Indeed, what we're saying is that basically, um, you know, when you use these price projections, then you don't need to use different discount rates. So what we're specifically, sometimes they're called um, uh, different escalation factors. Uh, and so, so, so that's basically what we're saying is, is you can, you can escalate the prices differently while keeping the discount rates, uh, the, 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 the same. And the discount rate is basically like how do you value the importance of future expenditures? Um, and so, you know, that one is tied a bit more <clears throat> to, um, uh, you know, a lot of times it's tied to uh, some, some government factors that are used uh, in basically how you uh, do future investments. Um, but what you, what you, the discount rate used for pavements would be quite different than uh, what you use for buildings where there's kind of a different market for those. But, um, but anyway, th th this is separate from uh, discount rates. Like I said, we're, we're, sometimes these are called escalation factors, um, and so that's how we handle those a little bit. Bit differently. Great. And we do have time for a few more questions, but I don't have any others in the chat box at the moment. So if anyone has any, um, please feel free to enter them. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, like we said, we oh, can, wait, I, have, um, oh, I do have sorry, one more that just came up. Yeah, please. Uh, in California, we have quarries showing only 20 years life, uh, 20 years left of service. How will that impact future decisions? Hmm. Um, you know, I, I think that what it will do is basically affect the uh, rates that we expect for um, uh, for that that exact commodity, right? Like essentially. <clears throat> Um, you know, that could increase the demand for specific types of uh, aggregates. And that's my understanding why, particularly on the West Coast, um, the, you know, for high-quality aggregates, there is some, some higher demand. Uh, and so <clears throat> I think as basically there are people searching for other uh, sources of those high aggregates, it could definitely affect the uh, prices. And, um, you know, it's certainly a, a, a tricky thing about some of these uh, price projections is that <clears throat> we try to have them go back as far as possible because then you capture various sources of volatility. But um, on the other hand, you um, you, you can't you, you know predict everything that's uh, going to happen. Like if there's some type of uh, catastrophic uh, event. The good thing about going far back is that you can capture different types of catastrophic events, but maybe not something that specific. But um, I think, it, you know, it, it's going to be an economics thing. Like scarcity is, is an economics concept. <clears throat> it just says when you run out of one thing, then it affects the price and then you shift to something else. So um, we're obviously not going to run ag out of aggregates, but specific uh, high quality aggregates, you know, that could be a challenge and it just means that the, the, the price to get sources for those higher quality aggregates is, is going to shift. I think. Great. Uh, clarification question on slide six. Um, does the 
uh, I'm sorry, is that asphalt binder or asphalt mix that's discussed on slide six? Um, I would, I, I'd have to look, I, to be honest, I can't remember off the top of my head. It, like I said, this is from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, which um, tracks that, and so um, I, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, and a final question uh, is, uh, do you take requests for modeling state networks similar to Colorado and Virginia? How would a DOT get your analysis for their networks? Sure. I mean, the best thing is just to get in touch with us, and um, <clears throat> we can certainly talk with them about uh, uh, doing a project on it. You know, what, what's useful for us is to get some additional experience with seeing how well these projections work and, you know, the extent to which we need to tweet them. So, yeah, just basically send uh, an email to me or Ann or to that uh, CS hub at MIT.edu, and we can talk about the best way to try to engage them. We did have a few more come in, so I'll address those. Okay, uh, the first is, are, are there any project-specific examples available using this analysis and how accurate the forecast has been? Um, and actually, we, I'll just ask this next one, too, because it's similar. Sure. And at some point, could you share a side-by-side -side comparison of real-world LCCA showing current means and the second showing inputs with your research? So. Um, sure, yeah. yeah. What well, we've... Um, so, sorry, can, can you read the, the, the first one again? Sure. Sorry about that. The first one is, are there yeah. any uh, project-specific examples available using this analysis, and how accurate has the forecast been? Mm -hmm. um, well, the tricky thing about that question is that basically <clears throat> when you do a – the only way we can measure accuracy is by doing that kind of backcasting approach, right, where basically when um, – the, the, the way that we do that is to basically say <clears> – <throat> Let me find that again. You know, <clears throat> what we do is we have to go back in time and say, you know, let's say we were standing here and then we make a projection, whatever, five years, 10 years, 15 years into the future, what was the error on that uh, uh, projection, right? And so we do that using our price projection. So the, the slope of this line would either be, you know, like let's say our specific price projection compared to no change in uh, real prices, right? So that's how we generate those plots with the um, the mean absolute percent error is by we do that a whole bunch for all of these. So when it comes to a, a project level one, we actually we, we we can't do that because we don't know what the prices will be in the future for that particular project. Um, so, so like I said, unfortunately, that's not possible. We can only do that for the uh, price projections in general and come up with charts like this um, and then basically just compare, you know, or like here's where it was for uh, uh, Colorado and then Minnesota. We can basically just say that, you know, assuming no change in real prices is a, is a prediction on its own. Um, and so, uh, so you're basically just saying which one, you know, would, would be better if you were able to take that uh, historical data and then do predictions into the future. Um, as for the, the second one was about have we compared our approach with basically doing uh, a, like, kind of a, a standard analysis, is that it? Or? Yeah, so the second one is the, kind of a request for a side-by-side -side of a real-world LCA showing current means and inputs uh, from CSM mm -hmm. research. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I don't have one at the tip of my fingers, but what we have done is shown uh, differences, in, and I can uh, follow up with some references that will be uh, of use to this person, but um, it, what we have done is shown um, differences between doing a deterministic analysis, which is what's usually done, that is including no uncertainty, um, and then comparing that with a probabilistic approach where you do include uncertainty. Um, <clears throat> And what we've shown is that the, the, there, are, there are definitely uh, different – it, 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 I it, it depends on the particular case, but uh, there can definitely be uh, differences in the outcomes depending on which uh, approach that you use. 
What, the reason that we like the probabilistic approach is because we know that there is uncertainty in these analyses, right? And so um, what we'd rather do is then, engineers do this all the time. I'd rather say what confidence level that I have in my results rather than, uh, you know, pretending like I can predict a specific uh, answer. Um, and so to uh, some extent, that's why we keep going back to this. And that's what engineers do with material properties all the time. Like uh, in MEPDG, it's, uh, it will show you, you know, here's, the, here's your IRI level at um, your, your, your roughless level at year 20 or whatever. What it's actually showing you is a 90% or 95% uh, confidence number on that. So we already do that uh, for engineering properties. What we're advocating for is that that should also be done uh, with the um, LCCAs, given the uncertainty in uh, initial prices and future prices and some of the other things as well. And so that's how we at least uh, compare our approach to the uh, conventional one. But as far as saying which one is more correct, when, when you're doing these uh, decisions about um, projects, I think that's, that's, it's a hard way to look at that because you don't know that until you're years into the future. And even then, you don't end up uh, uh, building both uh, designs, right? You just end up doing one, and so it's a hypothetical exercise. But so what we see it is basically how do we create the most robust decisions that we have confidence in, and we think by using these uh, probabilistic approaches is how you do that. All right. Do you know of any agency that uses nominal discount rates rather than the real rate? Um, I, I don't know what exactly is meant by uh, nominal discount rates, but basically the uh, discount rates that are used generally um, they will use factors that are that are recommended by the Office of Management and Budget, um, and so you, there are tables that the OMB provides um, that kind of make those recommendations. And some DOTs follow that or some DOTs uh, come up with assumptions that then uh, stick with those. So it, it varies by uh, from state to state. Great. And that looks like it was our final question. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Right. <laughs> Are there any others? Oh. Okay. All right. Well, um, thanks so much, everyone, for uh, joining, and uh, we'll be glad to, um, uh, you, you know, we hope that you can uh, follow us on a, a future uh, webinar as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.